What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If you're new here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. This is my statistics tutorial series, where I give you all the statistics knowledge that you need to conquer the data science world. In a lot of applied statistics and data science work, you have to estimate some kind of unknown quantity. But here's the thing, it's generally not enough just to provide a point estimate, you have to provide some kind of interval estimate. And this accomplishes two things. You're communicating how far off you might be in either direction, as well as how sure you are in your estimate. Now I'm also going to come back to this point, but the assumption you're generally going to make is that this unknown quantity has a fixed value. That is, there is one fixed true quantity here for the entire population. Again, more on that point in a little bit. The most common tool for providing interval estimates is what's called a confidence interval, which comes with a corresponding confidence level. So we're going to talk about these today, we're going to talk about the foundation for them, how you create them, and then some of the practical issues with them that you're going to come across in the real world. Just as an example, let's just say hypothetically, I want to know how many hours on average people in the United States spend on their phones in a day. The best possible way that I could answer that question would be to take a census of the entire population. That is, I survey every single person that's relevant inside the entire population, and I collect their data, or I ask the question. The problem with that is, that's logistically a nightmare, it's expensive, it's time consuming, nobody really does that. So what you have to do instead is you have to take a sample and you have to make inferences from that sample to the entire population. This also needs to be a random sample that we can reasonably assume is representative of our entire population. More on that towards the end of this video. Now just to lay the foundation here, we do have to go through a few definitions, so it's important to understand the difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter is a fixed, generally unknown quantity of an entire population of interest. That's what we're interested in learning about here today. Specifically, we're trying to estimate a population mean, which is a type of parameter. And we'll represent that population mean with the symbol mu. A statistic is a quantity that you've gathered from a sample, and it's likely going to be different each and every single sample that you take. Now there's tons of different examples of different statistics. The one we're going to see the most in this example exercise is a sample mean, and you represent a sample mean with x bar. Now that we have those definitions down, it's time to finish setting up this problem. So we're going to survey 50 different people, and we're going to ask them how many hours they spend using their cell phone. Or really what we're probably going to do is we're just going to use the data that's automatically generated by the phone. Then we're going to use our sample size, our sample mean, and our sample standard deviation to make a 95% confidence interval for the thing we're truly interested in here, which is the true population mean number of hours that Americans spend on their phones daily. So let's suppose we did our survey of 50 people, we found that our sample mean x bar was 3.2 hours, and our sample standard deviation s is 1.2 hours. Now just right off the bat, that sample mean 3.2 hours is our estimate of the true population mean. Now every confidence interval is of the same general form. It's your estimate of the parameter of interest, plus or minus a margin of error. We're going to build a 95% confidence interval here, but the programmer or study designer has completely free reign over what confidence level they want to select. It's pretty common to see 90% or 95% or 99% confidence intervals, but that's mostly just because they're nice looking numbers and you can pick whatever confidence level that you want. There are trade-offs with the lower or higher confidence levels related to what's called statistical power, as well as type 1 and type 2 errors, but that's a subject for a different video. The 95% confidence interval is the most commonly used interval in the statistical community, and it's a little bit arbitrary, but it's generally because it's a good middle ground between the various trade-offs. 
Also know that the higher your confidence level, the wider your confidence interval is going to be. Now that may seem a little bit counterintuitive at first, but just think of this extreme example. If you wanted a 100% confidence interval, you would literally have to go from negative infinity to infinity to have 100% confidence that your parameter is within that range. We're actually building confidence by increasing the range that is the net of possible values that this thing could lie inside. Then for our example, our formula for our confidence interval is x bar plus or minus t times the standard error of x bar, where the standard error of x bar is equal to the sample standard deviation s divided by the square root of n. Now that entire piece, t times the standard error of x bar, is what's called the margin of error. The statistical foundation for a confidence interval working is the central limit theorem. If you haven't seen my video on the central limit theorem, I'll have a card for it up above. Think of the quantity t as a multiplier, which we can learn by using a t distribution. Now for proportions, we actually would use a normal 0, 1 distribution, but for means, we have to use the t distribution. And the reason for that is a subject for a different video. One comment on the t distribution, it has only one parameter, and that's what's called the degrees of freedom. Now that may seem complex, and it is a little bit weird of a concept, but it's absolutely nothing crazy. Degrees of freedom, in statistical terms, is just the number of pieces of information that are free to vary in the calculation of an estimate. In the case we have here, where there's just one sample being taken, the degrees of freedom is just equal to the sample size n minus 1. And this is fairly easy to see. So in our example here, we have 50 data points, and our sample mean is 3.2. That's the average of all those 50 data points. But here's the thing. Once we know 49 of those data points, as well as the mean, we automatically know the 50th data point. So there are 49 independent pieces of information that are free to vary here before we know the 50th. So 50 minus 1 equals 49 degrees of freedom here. So coming back to our example, you can use R or you can use a table like this one. Now confidence intervals will generally make use of the two-tailed probability up top. So we're going to do 1 minus our confidence level, that's 0.95, to get 0.05 up at the top. And basically it's just because the range of values not in our confidence interval aren't just on one side. They're going to be both less than and greater than the range in our interval. Then note that our degrees of freedom are 49. Now this particular table actually jumps from 40 to 60 where the degrees of freedom are listed on the left hand side. Now generally it's good practice to use the lower degree of freedom because it just ends up giving you a higher multiplier and increasing the variability and the width of the interval and it's just a way of being more risk averse. But anyway, we use this table, we line up the 40 degrees of freedom with the 0.05 two-tailed probability, and we get a value of t equals 2.021. Now if we use r, we end up with the more precise t equals 2.0096. Now I like using r, so for the rest of this example, that's what we're going to use for t. Now all we have to do is plug all these numbers into the formula over here and we solve for a confidence interval of 2.859 to 3.541. So based on this exercise that we've just done, we are 95% confident that the true population mean number of hours that Americans spend on their phones per day is between 2.859 and 3.541. Now there are some more important definitions here to understand. One of them is that 95% number we've been talking about so much, that is your confidence level. The other is that confidence interval that you just created in the first place. That 95% number, or your confidence level, is really just a property of the process itself. And that basically tells us that if we repeated this process over and over again, that is we kept taking repeated random samples, computing different confidence intervals, we would expect 95% of those resulting confidence intervals to contain the true number that we're trying to estimate here. 
then that interval means that we're 95% confident based on the process that we used that that true number is within that interval that we just generated. So I'm gonna restate it here. We are 95% confident that the true population mean number of hours that Americans spend on their phones per day is between 2.859 and 3.541 hours. Now that is not the same thing as saying the probability is 95% that the true mean is between 2.859 and 3.541. Remember at the beginning of this video, I mentioned the true mean is a fixed number. So it's either between those two numbers in our interval or it's not. So that true probability is either zero or one. Just as a disclaimer to all of this, most of this makes the assumption that we're operating as a frequentist rather than as a Bayesian. And that's generally the way most people in the everyday world, when they're talking about confidence intervals, that's what they're doing even if they don't necessarily realize that they're doing it. Frequentist versus Bayesian is totally a subject for a different video, and it's one of the most hotly debated topics in the entire statistical community. But among people who use the Bayesian framework, you're going to hear the term credible interval used occasionally. In that case, we don't assume that the population mean is fixed in value, and you can talk about there being a probability that that number is within the range that you generate with your credible interval. But again, that's a different subject for a different day, and that's an entirely different framework from what most people think of when they talk about confidence intervals. Now, it has been my personal experience in working with clients that almost all of them have at least some understanding of what a confidence interval represents. Not all of them do, but most will, and frankly, a lot of them will appreciate, if not totally expect, that if you're estimating some quantity, you're also providing some range of uncertainty with it. However, invariably, where you're going to run into problems is not over how narrow or how wide your interval is or over the confidence level that you select. It's over actually finding a random sample. Because just think about it from my example. It would be extremely difficult to find 50 people who would actually provide a representative sample of all Americans, especially as it relates to something as interesting as phone usage. Just think. Phone usage varies over a tremendous number of factors, such as your age, probably whether you're in a rural or urban area, your gender, probably different things like that. So actually getting a random sample would take some extremely rigorous sample design. So this is just an overview of confidence intervals. The process will be essentially the same and the definitions will not change no matter what your parameter of interest here is, as long as we're treating the problem as a frequentist and not as a Bayesian. Go ahead and try to include these when you're working on an applied data science problem and your stakeholder asks you to estimate or infer something about some unknown quantity. Just understand how the random sample aspect could affect both your estimate and the amount of uncertainty about your estimate. Your stakeholders will thank you for asking those kinds of questions. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the most helpful thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, please consider smashing the like button, and then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.